Why don't we get into the Kyrie Irving saga? Because it seems like it is a saga over there in Brooklyn. Uh, what are your thoughts to, uh, obviously, I have a lot of respect for Kyrie Irving for what he said uh, on his Instagram. He came out. He really spoke from his heart. He, he, he told you what he felt what was going on with the vaccination and how the NBA told him that uh, in the beginning, before the season started, that he wouldn't have to get the vaccination. Now, all of a sudden, because of uh, the mandate over here in New York, he is forced to get it. So he doesn't want to do it. And now with the new governor and the new or the new mayor, uh, that could change uh, in the new year. Who knows what's going to happen? So what are your thoughts with Kyrie Irving? And do you think the Nets could win without Kyrie Irving in the Eastern Conference? Well, I think you just said it best with who knows with Kyrie Irving, right? In general, we have no full understanding with Kyrie Irving what the possibilities are. You know, I think there was a, a thought at one point of like, listen, he'll get the jab by the end of by the end of training camp. He'll be ready to roll at the start of the season. And then just slowly the story started trickling out where the Nets were like, uh, yeah, no, he, he he might not be getting this at all. We might have a problem on our hands. So, you know, it's it's kind of a wild situation in that scenario. So, you know, you said it with the new mayor coming in and him saying, I'm going to look at the vaccine mandates. There's a possibility, you know, when he takes office in January that he gets rid of the mandate and Kyrie could play. Steve Nash has said would welcome him back if he does. Uh, but that's still a lot to just hope for. And that's also two months away at this point. Like the whole season could be different. The Nets are talented enough to win the championship. I think even without Kyrie, they just have some work to do right now that they've been planning all off season, even in training camp when they thought they'd have Kyrie to have Kyrie. So now everything's been just thrown up in the air and they got to kind of figure out a new game plan, new rotations, who's going to fit and who's going to do what and things like that. So at times it's not going to look pretty, but we saw last night, like when they're rolling, nobody can stop KD. Before I get to my question, uh, Josh comments Errol's twin. So what do you guys think about that? Do you think they look like each other? Errol's twin? Who's my twin? <laughs> apparently apparently he thinks Mo is. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. Listen, two good-looking dudes. Nothing wrong with that. Hey, listen, I, I, I have no problem with that either. But uh, Josh, who's your twin? <laughs> oh, you, you thought you, you thought it, you thought it was a, a wannabe Adam Sandler. So. Well, <laughs> well, he doesn't look like Adam Sandler, but he surely acts like one. <laughs> so, so, so Mo, my question is uh, with Kyrie Irving. So, depending on how long it ends up going into the season, what at what point, whether it's with the team record, whether it's with the point guard production, or even James Harden continuing to struggle, like he did, what point do they either have to look to trade Kyrie Irving, maybe do a swap with with somebody like Damian Lillard or Ben Simmons? That's been rumored a lot. What point do they have to do that or even just try to uh, just trade for a replacement point guard? You know, I don't think they're going to. I just don't think – one, I don't know if there's a market for it. And let's just be honest here. With everything that's gone on with Kyrie over the past few seasons, like it, with this being the latest kind of chapter in the Kyrie saga, it's – I could see teams going like, we don't know what we're actually trading for, right? If it's not the vaccine, it could be something else. Remember last season, which I, I – it didn't bother me, but I know a lot of people were upset when Kyrie just took a few weeks off. You know, there's there's a lot of sort of questions around Kyrie that I think would make a team very nervous to trade for him. You know, if you're Portland and you're trading Damian Lillard, you're going to have a million offers for him. You know, you you can't trade for the guy. And then Kyrie goes, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to retire. You know, that's something he's threatened to do if he gets traded. There's a lot of stuff that's n nervous. About. So I don't even know if the Nets would have the option to trade him just on the pure fact of there may not be a market for him, which is crazy considering how talented he is when he's on the court. Um, so I, I, to answer your question, I don't know if there's a timetable for it because I just don't think there's a market. You brought up a point guard that's hurting my heart right now because he's on my fancy team and he's killing me. Damian Lillard. <laughs> Has not had a great start to the season. And this one kind of stings a little bit more than his normal he slow never start. never has a good start. That's what happens when you have up the question, Hattie. Mm -hmm. Calm down. So anyway. <laughs> Who would you call me? Hattie? What the hell is a Hattie? Somebody that wears a hat. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, as I was so rudely interrupted, mm -hmm. this one stings a little bit more than his normal slow starts because it was very well documented that his relationship with Portland's fractured. He doesn't like Chauncey Billups as his head coach, is there more to this than just Damian Lillard having a slow start, or is his mind not really into it right now, even though now reports are coming out saying he's demanding and really pushing for them to go get Draymond Green? Yeah, I mean, it's 
interesting in that sense. Like everything I've seen from Dame is he's not ready to leave Portland yet. You know, and maybe that changes as they continue to lose some games. He's starting off slow. It's, you know, it's like we were saying earlier, it tends to happen with him regularly. The, keep him on your fantasy team because what's going to happen is I'm trying to he's, Curry. He's, well, okay. Well, if you're getting Steph, then okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all right with that. But like if it's for anything less than that, you're, if he's going to blow up. He's right. too good of a player to be shooting this poorly. That's going to come back. And I think it's just a matter of him finding his rhythm, getting comfortable with everything that's going along. You know, it's been a weird sort of six months for him since the off season, basically, you know, where he was contemplating demanding a trade ended up backing off of that. They bring in Chauncey Billups and, He's building a rapport with Chauncey. You know, when you look at this roster, he asked for a championship roster, and they brought Cody Zeller and Larry Nance Jr. Not really much of an upgrade. So I think there's a lot of frustration there in everything that they have going on. But just keep an eye on it. I I just don't think Dame's going to start out or stay going this cold for this long. I'm waiting any second for the breakout game. We are talking to uh, the Athletic NBA podcast host and Bleacher Report NBA writer Mo Dockiel. Now, Mo, going back to New York, let's go to the New York Knicks. And, and the Knicks started off very strong. They were 5-1. and one. They were playing great basketball. Tom Thibodeau was pre- preaching defense. This, this team, Walker was playing defense. Fournier was playing, playing defense. The last two games, they have not played good defense. And, and really, Julius Randle has become really a stopgap ball hawk. And that's that's what I see him to be. I, I, I am not a big fan of Julius Randle. I think he reminds me of a, a poor man's Carmelo Anthony. That's where I see him to be. Um, but we saw what he did in the playoffs last year. He completely choked when the fans started to, to come into the stadiums. And even against the Bulls, when there was, what, five uh, four seconds left of the game, he missed two foul shots, could have cost them the game uh, right. over there with the Bulls. When you look at this team, could you win as Julius Randle as your number one guy? Or do the Knicks need to look forth at at maybe another guy that could be available at the trade deadline as a number one guy? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not a big Julius Randle believer. He's been great. He's been awesome in New York, had put up big numbers in the regular season last year. I was very suspicious and, and wanted to see what it would look like once teams were able to game plan for him during the playoffs. And we saw Atlanta kind of just took him out of his rhythm in that series. And the Knicks responded by adding more more scoring in Kemba Walker, in Evan Fournier, and everything that goes with it. But those guys don't defend. They may defend a game here, a game there. You might get a good night defensively. But you're not going to get a consistent, you know, full stretch of a season with those guys. Kemba Walker with his knees, very questionable. And so my big question whenever I watch the Knicks is, their offense just looks the same to me. Everything runs through Randall. Randall's kind of a terminator. You know, anytime they're running a play and the ball ends up in his his hands, the play's over. He's going to try to go one-on-one and take it from there. And now it's just on him. Can he recreate what he created last season and, and build that up for them? And I just don't think he can. And I just don't think he's a number one guy. I don't think he's a guy you can win a championship with him as your number one, maybe even not as your number two. So what do you think the ceiling is that for the Knicks this year? A lot of people think with the Nets possibly losing Kyrie Irving for a while, maybe they, or they're they the team that sneaks into the top three. Milwaukee, Miami, Atlanta, teams like that, they're kind of in that running the 76ers the way Charlotte? they played. The, well, yeah, the, I don't think a lot of people were expected that at the beginning of the season, though. So where do you think the Knicks ceiling is in terms of like a, a being regular season seed and also what kind of playoff identity you think they could have? Because it was bad last year, but we know a lot of times good defensive teams can do well. Yeah, I think the ceiling for them is probably about a five seed. I don't see them having home court advantage this season. Uh, I just think so many teams are better. We were already watching Miami looking way better, I think, than anybody was fully anticipating. Not yeah. me. All right, all right. Well, that's, I that's Miami, good on you, brother. I think Miami's overrated. I, I really do, and I, I, I honestly – they lost the other day. They're six and two. Oh, what a shame! And, and I don't think I don't think they have the depth that everybody thinks that they have. I really don't. I mean, I, I don't. I don't think anybody's questioning the depth. I think because we've. I'm with you on the depth. I think that's the biggest concern. But if they're healthy by the end of the season, they're going to be a tough team to deal with. The question is, how healthy can they stay throughout the regular season? Because look, Jimmy Butler's old. Kyle Lowry's old. 
you know, you're you're depending on guys. You know, PJ Tucker is barely moving out there, still productive, <laughs> but sl- barely moving. And I think you you just kind of are hoping you can cobble everything together and keep it going. But when you look at the Knicks, I just don't think they have that chance to really jump a lot of those teams. And with the Eastern Conference so much better, I could see them anywhere from five to the seven, maybe even eight range. You know, I could see them in the playing tournament, and that might just be a product of this team's better this year. But the East has gotten so much better; they might just fall. Have to be the team that. But don't falls. you don't you think the Knicks have the depth and, and 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 really what they added with Fournier and Walker? They have more depth offensively than a lot of these teams. I, I mean, the Chicago Bulls added a lot of pieces. Obviously, uh, with with the point guard that they added and, and uh, Ball, and then some of the other players that they added in the off season. They're a very good team, and they have depth. Uh, Toronto, I don't believe Toronto is going to be a, a, a on top of the Eastern Conference. Brooklyn, we don't know what they are because of Kyrie Irving not being in the lineup. Washington is not five and three. They're not. They're not a good team. Philadelphia, are, are we really going to believe in them? Joel Embiid is really their only big player. I mean, Harris is a good player, but they have no depth, and I don't trust Doc Rivers. You you say Miami? Miami don't have depth. I mean, out of all these teams, really in Eastern Conference, the Knicks have the most depth out of all. I'm not saying this because I'm a Knicks guy. I'm just saying what I see in this roster. They have more depth. And, and their weakness this year was the point guard position. Now you see it as a strength. If Walker could stay healthier, healthy, they have Rose, they have Quigley, and then they have the, the big men that they have. They have Robinson and Nerlens Noel. Nerlens Noel coming back from an injury, he still needs to fit into what this offense is going to be. I beg to differ. I, I think the Knicks could absolutely be a top four seed in the, in, in the, in the Easter Conference. But it's just funny because it's Kemba Walker hasn't been healthy and played a full season in Absolutely. God knows how long, Absolutely. right? Like his, yes. it, it, it's, it is almost day to day with him mm-hmm. in terms of games he's going to be able to play. And that, that's a big thing. Mitchell Robinson has not proven to be able to stay healthy all season. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. was, it was in that Chicago game where it looked like he rolled his ankle. I mean, mm-hmm. he, Knock on wood, I hope he stays healthy and, and, and keeps it going. He was able to stay in that game and, and keep going. But there's always a moment where you watch it and you're just like, ah, crap, here we go again. Mm-hmm. You know, Rose, solid, solid dude, but also getting up there in age. So I wouldn't be shocked if that stuff begins to kind of start to fall off. Evan Fournier, pretty dependable. I think you don't have to worry too much along those lines. Like they have depth, but also at that time when you're looking at it, it's like, but how good are these guys? Like I like quickly, but it's not like I'm in love with quickly. And now he's not getting as many minutes as he was before because one Walker is out there. One Fournier is out there. One Rose is out there. There's it's a shorter leash, right? Like if, if he goes out there, has a bad turnover, Tibbs can throw him out and bring somebody else. in. it'd be one thing Gardner would go nuts if he subbed in Alfred Payton for him like last season. But if it was, but now if you're putting in Fournier or somebody in replace of him, it's, you know, it just slows his development down and that stuff. So I don't even know how much you're going to even get fully out of quickly. So I just think with them, I just, I, I don't trust their offense at the end of the day. It's very one-on-one centric and you're really dependent on Kemba Walker staying healthy. And I just don't trust the knees. So we kind of hit on my question already. Everyone was talking about LA. Oh, they bring in Mello. They go get Russell Westbrook with LeBron James. Anthony Davis was already there, and they they bring back Rondo, and everyone's talking about the big three in Brooklyn or the Bucks. I personally think that the NBA Finals are two teams that no one's talking about right now. Golden State looks amazing together, and that's without Clay. And the Miami Heat, to me, are the best team, the best starting five in the East as a whole, and they play two-way basketball. My thing with Golden State is, you know, their their defense has looked really good right now early on that's going to change when clay comes back because you're going to have to play clay minutes clay is not coming back and immediately going to be ready to roll doesn't matter how much practice he does or whatnot he hasn't played in two years basically right right? and at this point he's going to come on the court it's going to take him two to three months and we saw it last year with kd and the achilles you know as good as kd looked when he was rolling he missed a ton of games because your body does not respond all that well to after you tear your Achilles and go try to play any other sport. Now you're going to start to, you got to worry about hamstring strains. You got to worry about your groin, your, your knee, your, your legs are going to overcompensate. You know, your left leg is going to be trying to take on more of a low. It's a whole thing of your body just has to learn how to recover again. So I think that's going to slow them down a bit. 
On top of that, you know, they got a big game the other night from Jordan Poole, but he started out the season pretty slow. Like you're depending on a lot of guys that I'm not sure I really trust. And I think by the end of the season, it's going to be one of those things where Steph has to go nuclear every night for them to really have a chance. I think they're on a hot start right now. Relatively easy schedule for the most part. Let's see how it continues once things pop off, but I'm not fully there yet on the Golden State Warriors being contenders.